There we go. Uh, welcome. I'm Jonah Lacqua, and I am Executive Director of the History Project, and I'm so pleased to welcome you here tonight for our uh, special spooky season event, the Queer History of Dracula. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the History Project, we are Boston's LGBTQ archives. We are a volunteer-driven community archives in, in Boston, uh, and we document, preserve, and share LGBTQ history. And we're able to do that work with the support of folks like you um, who help us to uh, find speakers and topics, who donate collections to the archives, who volunteer with us, and who also uh, donate to support our work. So I'm gonna put a link in the chat if you're interested in uh, making a donation tonight. And for those of you who already have, thank you so much for your support. Um, my plug or plugs for this evening, we have two more uh, upcoming events. One is on November 4th, we'll be celebrating our History Maker Awards. That event is hybrid, so you can either come in person to the St. Patolf Club to celebrate the work of John Ward, the founder of GLAAD, and Treandre Valentine, the executive director of the Mass Trans Political Coalition, uh, or you can join us online. And uh, later on in November, we haven't announced yet, but we're planning on November 14th to have a Trans History Wikipedia Edit-a-thon, and that'll be happening in collaboration with the Digital Transgender Archive. So we're really looking forward to that. So um, my, it's my pleasure, I'm trying to find the, uh, the link here. It's my pleasure to introduce you to tonight's speaker and topic. Um, tonight we are, are hearing from Ranger, uh, Megan, is it Michael or Michelle? I didn't ask you and I've known you for so long and I can't believe I don't know how to pronounce your last name. Michael. Michael, Megan Michael, uh, Ranger at uh, Longfellow House Washington's headquarters, National Historic Site is here to uh, talk with us tonight about the queer history of Dracula. Uh, Megan's worked at Longfellow since 2018 uh, with a primary fo focus on researching and interpreting the LGBTQ history of the house. If you have not heard, that house is real gay. We have uh, some recorded presentations with uh, Megan and other rangers from Longfellow talking about the queer history of the house. Um, before working at Longfellow, Megan worked at the National Parks of Boston, Appomattox Courthouse, National Historical Park, and at Gettysburg. And she's currently working on her bachelor's degree in history. Um, my other plug for Longfellow as well, uh, this event is, I think, technically part of your speaker series, um, but we want to invite you to check out the rest of the 2021 fall lecture series. It looks like the next one is taking place on the 12th on the poetry of science. So here's a link to that in the chat. And with that, uh, I turn it over to Megan, who will do her presentation. And then at the end, we'll have time for Q&A. Um, so hold your questions until the end, and then we'll have time for some, some discussion. Thank you so much, Megan. Thank you, Joan. I always love getting to work with the History Project. It really is my favorite thing to do every year. Um, so as I'm sure all of you are aware, this talk is going to be on the queer history of Dracula. Um, honestly, the history of vampires in literature in general is a very, very queer topic. So we'll be diving quite a bit into that as well as Dracula specifically. But let me first start by sharing my screen. All right. All right, so to really begin with the queer history of Dracula, we need to go to sort of the mythology of the vampire in general that authors like Bram Stoker would have been building upon. Um, so, with that in mind, let's get to a brief history of queer vampires. And where this history really begins is the vampires of legend itself. Uh, vampire legend has existed for thousands upon thousands of years. There are tales of vampire stories in ancient Greece, ancient Rome. There are tales of vampires in China and Japan. It is a very universal fear throughout most cultures around the world. But the vampire that Bram Stoker and a lot of other 
literary authors are really going to be building on is really the vampire lore of Eastern Europe in particular. Um, the non-literary vampire really focused on a fear of disease more than anything, a fear of disease, a fear of plague, and a fear of death in particular. Um, enough so that during times of plague, vampire panics often happen. Um, today, we have a lot of explanations for a lot of the fears that people would have had. Uh, things like the bubonic plague, rabies, porphyria, all of these different illnesses are likely some of the biggest culprits of a lot of the vampire panics. But despite what it might seem, the fear of vampire is not just in the realm of the Middle Ages. It's something that continues to be very modern and even contemporary to Bram Stoker's own time. Genuine fear of vampires existed in the 19th century. Even here in the United States, there were a number of vampire scares throughout New England throughout the 19th century, in the 1830s, the 1850s, and even in the 1890s. Um, and because of that, the vampire was not this ancient historical thing that people were kind of mythologizing. To some people, they truly did exist. Um, so as you can probably imagine, inspired by these legends, when it came to actually turning them into a form of literature, authors were able to expand what the vampire represented. That's really the main thing of literature is things can represent anything you want them to represent. And since the vampire was something scary and terrifying to a lot of people, when you get to the 19th century, it doesn't just have to represent disease. In a lot of cases, the vampire of literature is going to shift to a fear of the other. And the other could be someone from another country. It could be a woman who defies sort of the norms of the day, or it could be queer. And all of these different things are things that authors in the 19th century are going to use the vampire as a metaphor for. Um, the other is considered a threat to society. They are made into a scapegoat. And because of that, the inherent queerness of the literary vampire really starts to make a bit of sense. Dracula is without a doubt the most wildly popular and successful vampire novel of all time. Uh, there are still movies and TV shows and podcasts being made about it. It inspired all of the vampire lore that we have to this day. Much more modern iterations of vampires take a lot of their rules from the rules that Bram Stoker created. But Bram Stoker did not just create this on his own. He built it up based on other authors who were writing about vampires long before him. And really the earliest literary vampire story that we can kind of pinpoint with this theme in mind is going to be The Vampire by John Polidori. Um, the Vampire was published in 1819 and it was very heavily inspired by a man in his life named Lord Byron. Uh, Lord Byron was very aristocratic. He was referred to as mad, bad, and dangerous to know. The vampire of the 19th century is incredibly Byronic because of that. And the vampire in this story, Lord Ruthven, is a very charismatic, dangerous figure in his own right. Um, and the vampire in this story instills both desire and repulsion in the narrator. He's drawn to the vampire while at the same time being afraid of him and disgusted by him. And there's a secret between the two of them that Lord Ruthven forces him to vow never to tell anyone else. 
there are also a lot of allusions to the ancient Greeks and all of that. So it's a very coded story. And Lord Byron and the vampire really set the stage for the modern literary vampire. There are gonna be some other vampire stories in between. There is a serialized story called Barney the Vampire, which I can best describe as basically a soap opera. There are some issues of Barney the Vampire where he's not even a vampire, he's a lawyer. There is no continuity, there is no lore to this. So I think the next big inspiration on this story is probably a fan favorite, which is Carmilla. Um, Carmilla was published in 1872 by Sheridan Le Fanu. And what's interesting about this story is it ties into a fear of the other on two very distinct and important levels. It's again, a fear of queerness in the story of Carmilla and the woman that she is after. But it also is a story about how these women defy the authority of men. They protest the rules and norms of the day. And it's a threat to the patriarchy itself. And because of that, the otherness of this story is really twofold. It's a fear of queerness. It's also, a fear of feminism and women starting to demand more in their lives. And that in itself is going to influence Bram Stoker because by the time you get to the 1890s, you're getting to an era of the new woman and women who are going out and working and riding bicycles and gaining independence they've never had before. And that is something that doesn't really fit with much of the Victorian era up to that point. But as James Jenkins, who owns Valancourt Books wrote, the traditional explanation for the gay slash horror connection is that it was impossible for them to write openly about gay themes back then, or even perhaps express them since words like gay and homosexual didn't exist. So they sublimated them and expressed them in more acceptable forms using the medium of a transgressive genre like horror fiction. And so when it comes to stories like Dracula, it's not just going to be the cultural anxieties of the time. And I will get into some of the other things that Bram Stoker is going to be dealing with in his life at that point, but his personal life, not just culturally, is also going to heavily influence this story. And that's where we get into the next phase of this, which is his real life personal inspirations. So with that in mind, Bram Stoker himself, he was born in Dublin in 1847. And for much of his youth, Bram Stoker was a very sickly young man. Um, he was very ill. He was often bedridden for a good portion of his childhood. And one of the things he found in his life that brought him joy and escapism was reading. He loved reading stories. He loved literature. He loved theater. And theater is going to play a key role in his life when he's older. But as with a lot of people that I talk about in these lectures and in general, one of his earliest and biggest inspirations is going to be a man named Walt Whitman. I, I think every single time I've given a talk for the History Project, Walt Whitman has come up. I cannot escape him no matter how hard I try because Walt Whitman really was the biggest significant queer figure for a lot of men in this era. Um, his collections of poem, Leaves of Grass, really was considered a gospel for a lot of queer men at the time. It was something that a lot of people connected to. And in the 1870s, when Bram Stoker is in his 20s, he discovers the works of Walt Whitman for the first time. While he's attending university, he immediately becomes a fan and tries to get his friends to read Walt Whitman as well. With a lot of struggle, people 
were not super keen to read Whitman and Bram Stoker got a little defensive of him. But Bram Stoker took it a bit more seriously than others because he decided to write to Walt Whitman himself. He wrote Whitman two letters early on, one in 1872 and one in 1876. He did not send the letter from 1872. After he wrote it, he folded it up, hid it in a drawer and forgot about it for four years until he rediscovered it and decided to send it along with an additional letter. The additional letter was written on Valentine's Day of all days. And both letters are incredibly interesting. Um, and I have a few quotes from both of them. The letter he wrote later that he used to provide context for the earlier letter includes, do not think me cheeky for writing this. I only hope we may sometime meet and I shall be able to perhaps to say what I cannot write. The letter he wrote earlier is much more heavy and blatant. And I think part of the reason why he didn't send it immediately, because some of the things he writes about Walt Whitman include, you have shaken off the shackles and your wings are free. I have the shackles on my shoulders still, but I have no wings. If you are going to read this letter any further, I should tell you that I am not prepared to give up all else so far as words go. You see, I have called you by your name. I have been more candid with you. I have said more about myself to you than I have said to anyone before. You will not be angry with me if you have read so far. You will not laugh at me for writing this to you. I don't think you will laugh, Walt Whitman, nor despise me. But at all events, I thank you for all the love and sympathy you have given me in common with my kind. What Bram Stoker meant by that, we're never gonna know for sure, but I'm pretty sure. Um, this is a very loaded letter. And in many ways, it does seem a bit like a coming out in sort of the modern concept we have. And Bram Stoker does eventually get to meet Walt Whitman. In the 1880s, he travels to America, travels all down the East Coast. And one of the places he visits is New Jersey, where he and Henry Irving, who I'm gonna talk about in a second, pay Walt Whitman a visit. Over the next couple decades, for as long as Walt Whitman is still alive, there is some form of correspondence there between the three of them. Um, they also help Walt Whitman provide him some money when he was going through some financial troubles. They really become friends with Whitman. They really considered him to be an older, older mentor figure to really both of them. Um, but Henry Irving, I think is going to play a key role in a lot of what I'm talking about as well. Because Henry, Irving is a very complicated figure in Bram Stoker's life, um, but without a doubt the most important relationship in Bram Stoker's life. Uh, in 1876, the two of them met at a house party. And at this point, Henry Irving had heard about Bram Stoker. Bram Stoker had heard about a Henry Irving. And Irving recites a poem in honor of Bram Stoker. And as Stoker puts it, it sent him into something like hysterics. And from that day on, Stoker was devoted to Henry Irving. Two years later, uh, Bram Stoker begins working as Henry Irving's manager. And they sign on to the Lyceum Theater, Henry Irving's theater, and Stoker is going to work for Henry Irving for the next 28 years, uh, managing his theater, managing his acting career. Uh, the two of them really became inseparable. And as one contemporary wrote about this relationship, to Bram, Irving is as a god and can do no wrong. And 
a biographer referred to Irving as the most important love relationship of his adult life. Irving was not a perfect figure though. He was notoriously cold. He was incredibly charming. He was very debonair. Um, people would come from all over the world to see him perform. He was handsome. He was aristocratic. He also was known for just being very distant. And there were definitely times throughout this almost 30 year friendship where Stoker really felt that he was losing Irving, that Irving was moving on to the next thing. And Stoker would do anything to win Irving back. And a lot of biographers, whether they view this as a friendship, whether they view this as more romantic, whatever their personal feelings on this relationship are, the one thing that most biographers agree with is that Henry Irving was the inspiration for Dracula himself, um, who in the story is a very charismatic, very debonair count who is cold and yet alluring. And it's very easy to see these parallels um, in Stoker's life. But there's one other piece to the puzzle in all of the things that are happening that I really feel cement really the queer history surrounding this story before getting into the story itself. And that is another figure that I cannot escape no matter how hard I try, Oscar Wilde. Oscar Wilde is probably well known to most of the people attending this lecture, but he was a world famous poet, a playwright, an author, and he was a contemporary of Bram Stoker's. They were both born in Dublin and they probably met at a literary salon that Oscar Wilde's mother would run um, in the 1870s. Stoker also attended college with Oscar Wilde's older brother. So they were part of that same social circle. And in 1875, Bram Stoker was invited to the Wild residence to celebrate Christmas with them. So clearly they were close enough that they were celebrating holidays together. And they both end up moving to London at different times, but they're going to be part of the same network again. While Bram Stoker is managing Henry Irving's theater, whose plays are being performed in Henry Irving's theater. Oscar Wilde is putting on these magnificent plays and the actors that are in these performances are mutual friends. People like Ellen Terry, Sarah Bernhard, and of course, Henry Irving. They all form this literary theatrical circle together. And there's also the interesting side note of the fact that at that Christmas party in 1875, Oscar Wilde at that point was courting a woman named Florence Balcombe. Not long after this Christmas party, Bram Stoker is courting Florence Balcombe and Bram Stoker does marry her. And Florence and Oscar continue to be friends even after this. And they end up going to parties together, all three of them. It's, there's evidence to suggest that Wilde would send the Stokers copies of his books and plays. Um, they would all go to parties and dinners at the Lyceum. Um, Oscar Wilde would go to house parties at the Stokers house. And the Stokers, always attended opening night of Oscar Wilde's plays. So there was definitely a friendship there. And it's really interesting that when Oscar Wilde is put on trial for the crime of gross indecency, all of this is erased. And Bram Stoker immediately takes a step back. And the fall of Oscar Wilde is going to have some pretty severe ramifications on Bram Stoker, but also on queer history in general. 
before you have Oscar Wilde really becoming openly notorious for his homosexuality, queerness was not something that was particularly mainstream. It was not something that everybody knew about. But after this, it becomes pathologized. It becomes medicalized. It becomes something that people openly write about in sometimes positive ways, like the University of Magnus Hirschfeld, and also in some negative ways as well. But the point is, people now know about homosexuality and queerness in a way that they never would have before this trial. And so people are suddenly much more aware of it. It becomes much more of a cultural thing that people know about. And friends of Oscar Wilde, after he's convicted of the crime of sodomy, is sentenced to two years of hard labor, which was the maximum sentence at the time for this crime. And almost all of his friends are going to abandon him. Um, he does have some that stay loyal. Most significantly, as far as sort of mainstream friends are going to be concerned, is Henry Irving. Irving continues to defend Oscar Wilde from critics and enemies, even after all of this. Bram Stoker does not. But what's interesting is as he distances himself from this, Dracula begins to truly formulate in his brain. It's a story that he had started taking notes on in 1890. He doesn't start writing it in earnest until the month after Oscar Wilde was thrown in jail. And so clearly this trial is having some sort of effect on him. But as for the rest of Bram Stoker's life, it seems to really force Stoker into a much more defensive position. He genuinely becomes fiercely homophobic in the last few years of his life. He demands that all homosexual authors in Britain be imprisoned um, for being gay, which if it sounds like a refutation of everything that happened up to that point, it's also important to note that Bosey Douglas, who was Oscar Wilde's lover, also became incredibly homophobic in his later years. So this was not something that would have been particularly unusual. And it really cements sort of his own beliefs in his later works. Um, Bram Stoker writes a number of books about literature and the theater um, towards the end of his life. One of them is the censorship of fiction. And in this, he's really talking about how you need to toe the line and how you can't write about certain beliefs and impulses that you have. You can't even really code them. There are some things that you just can't write about. But in the decades before he writes this, Dracula does have a lot of coding. And I think it's pretty clear that Oscar Wilde's influence on him does also have an influence on this story. As Talia Schaefer in her article, A Wild Desire Took Me, writes, to homophobes, vampirism could function as a way of naming the homosexual as monstrous, dirty, threatening. To homosexuals, vampirism could be an elegy for the enforced treatment of their desires. Dracula, however, functions as both an accusation and an elegy. Dracula as a novel represents the many anxieties that Oscar Wilde and his downfall represented to people. Dracula as a story, as Schaefer says, both vilifies the inherent queerness of the vampire, but at the same time, there's a lot of empathy there as well. And that's probably the most interesting part of this whole thing, which leads us into the final part of this lecture, which is, of course, Dracula, the novel itself. And 
the main plot line that I think has the most overarching queer story to it is going to be the story of Jonathan Harker within it. Um, Jonathan Harker is a very interesting character. He's not really the fan favorite for a lot of people, um, but I think he's the most complex of all of the characters in the story. And if you have not read Dracula or if you have not, if you don't know how the full story goes, there are definitely going to be spoilers from this point on. Um, but the story of Dracula begins from Jonathan Harker's point of view. And he starts off this novel as a typical Victorian gentleman. Um, he's incredibly masculine. He is very in control of his life. As he's traveling, he's obtaining recipes for his fiance to cook for him and providing commentary on everything he's seeing. And he's there on a business trip to try to provide some legal business for Count Dracula, who's planning on buying property in England. And Harker is really the one who's facilitating these transactions. And as you enter this novel, he really does fill that traditional Victorian hero role. Uh, but the moment he sets foot in Dracula's castle, the narrative completely changes. And this is where I feel Jonathan is such a compelling and interesting character. As soon as he arrives, he immediately begins to lose all agency. And really comparing him to other characters and stories, he takes on the role of a gothic heroine more than a gothic hero throughout the rest of this section of the novel. He is confined to the castle. He is trapped. He cannot escape. He is essentially a prisoner from the moment he sets foot inside. Dracula tells him where he may or may not go. And though he's provided with every luxury he needs, he increasingly fears exactly what Dracula's intentions are. And Jonathan himself compares himself to a gothic heroine. He really writes about the fact that he feels like he is not the one in control of this situation. And he feels that he is a young woman who is writing at her desk to a long lost lover, not sure what will happen to him next. And also, as I put here, he compares himself to a love struck woman in the novel as well. And despite the fact that Dracula lays a bunch of rules that he must follow, Jonathan goes out of his way to break these rules. He is not a damsel who is completely defenseless, but he is someone who no longer has the advantage of what you would expect this character to have in the beginning. In one really interesting moment that I find kind of strange, um, Dracula and Jonathan are discussing Jonathan staying a few months longer, which was not part of the deal to begin with. And Jonathan, when recounting this conversation, writes, I was a prisoner, and that if I wished it, I could have no choice. Why he said, if I wished it, and not if he wished it, makes it really interesting, because Jonathan doesn't have a say in this. So why didn't he talk about if Dracula wished it, he could have no choice. It, it's a very coded line, making it seem like Jonathan, at least deep down in some way, kind of enjoys being here, at least on a very subconscious level. But even so, he's not happy to be here. And when breaking one of Dracula's rules, he stumbles upon a wing of the house where he comes in contact with Dracula's brides, um, the three women who live in the castle. And 
he immediately falls under their spell. And this really ties into, I think, the other cultural fear at the time, which was the fear of the new woman, of the masculinized woman who is in control of her life, who is going out and doing her own thing. Because the brides of Dracula in this scene are in the position of power here. They are the dominant ones. And they're the ones to, there's really no way to avoid some of the innuendos of vampires, but they're the ones who are about to penetrate him. And he is eager for this. He is eager for this gender role reversal. And the only thing that stops it from happening is Dracula barging in, which leads to one of my favorite scenes in the entire novel. Um, as Dracula stops them from attacking Jonathan, one of the brides yells, you yourself never loved, you never love. And Dracula turns back to Jonathan and whispers, yes, I too can love. And even Jonathan in the novel comments on the strangeness of this line. But it's not just that line. He also stakes a claim to Jonathan Harker in the scene by saying, this man belongs to me. This man belongs to me was the first line that Bram Stoker wrote when he began writing Dracula in 1890. But the line immediately follows with, I want him, which was cut out of the novel. So it seems even Bram Stoker backpedals the scene just a little bit. But there's still much to be said about this scene and the fact that Dracula is declaring his love for another man and his claim on another man. And again, this is something that would not have been lost on readers in the aftermath of Oscar Wilde's trial. They might not have immediately pegged this is a very queer story, but they would have definitely noted that this is a very different relationship. And what's really interesting is Jonathan does manage to escape. And the rest of the novel, with many other characters involved, is really a quest to kill Dracula and destroy him once and for all. But as the novel progresses, Dracula and Jonathan begin to switch places. Um, Dracula starts this novel as very pale, very pallid, with stark white hair. And Jonathan ends the novel that way. Jonathan, at the beginning of the novel, is weak and swooning and in need of someone to protect him. And at the end of the novel, that's Dracula. And Dracula at the beginning is very strong, very dominant. And at the very end, that is Jonathan Harker. By the end of the novel, it's hard to see where Dracula ends and where Jonathan Harker begins. The two have influenced each other so much and changed each other so much that they really become, in many ways, the exact same person. At the heart of this horror novel, Stoker shows that the normal man and the depraved man are one and the same. They really begin to become a single unit. And that's one of the most interesting things about this story. But there's a much more obvious one as well. And this is the final deep dive into the novel itself that I'll get into. Because there's really no way to avoid it. And it is the use of blood itself. <laughs> Blood transfusions play a major role in this story because Dracula is draining people of their blood. And one of his main victims throughout this novel is a character named Lucy. Every night, Dracula comes into her room and drains her of her blood. And then the next morning, Van Helsing, um, a doctor who was supposed to be taking care of her, and her suitors come in to try to save her and replenish her blood. Um, 
one of the first people to give her a blood transfusion is going to be her fiance, but Van Helsing will also give her a transfusion. Quincy Morris will give her a blood transfusion. Jack Seward will give her a blood transfusion. And Van Helsing makes a joke about all of this, saying that because they are all giving Lucy their blood, they are all married to her, and that makes Lucy a bigamist. This is a very blatant joke in the story. And the logical, unstated conclusion to this, though, is if it's what the blood that makes you married, the blood isn't going to Lucy in the end. The blood is then going to Dracula. So Van Helsing's blood is running through Dracula's veins. Quincy Morris's blood is running through Dracula's veins. And if the metaphor applies to Lucy, it has to apply to Dracula as well. And with each transfusion, the, the metaphor really is the metaphor of an exchange of bodily fluids. Again, there's really no way to not take on the sexual connotations of what a vampire represents. And that's probably the other main clear sort of lean of this story. So let's now conclude this and bring it to the modern day because Dracula is not the first queer sort of vampire story and it is absolutely not the last. <laughs> Um, throughout the 20th century into the 21st century, queer vampires become a major sort of player in popular culture. I think most famously Anne Rice's interview with the vampire really kind of sets the stage um, for this new era of queer vampires. But you also have a lot of film adaptations in the 1970s of Carmilla um, in the 1980s. You have movies like uh, Fright Night and The Lost Boys, which are also very, very heavily queer coded as well. And the question that remains with all of that is, how do you feel about this representation? Um, because in many of these cases, the vampires are still the villains. They are still hunting innocent people and hurting them and changing them but at the same time there is on the flip side of this as society fears this other as society fears us essentially in a lot of ways it's fun to root for the villain that everybody else hates and how do you Again, how do we feel about that? It's a complicated issue. The queer coding of villains goes far beyond the story of vampires, but it's a story that we're still grappling with now. And Dracula is just one example in a long history of it. So when it comes to the 20th century, as the modern LGBTQ rights movement gained prominence, as the AIDS epidemic inspired a brutal wave of homophobia, vampires being sensual and glamorous while also being predators becomes a metaphor in its own right. And so again, that's something we're still grappling with. So with that, how do you feel about it? And with that, I will turn it back to Joan and thank you all for listening to me rant about this very nice subject for an hour. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, and with that, we still have about 15 minutes for, for Q&A. Um, and so if folks have some questions, um, we can start by doing the, the hand raise function or feel free to put your question in the chat and I can ask Megan and the group It's Out Loud. Um, I know that while you were talking, I was making a list of <laughs> all the gay vampires that I could think of. Um, and it's not a very long list, but uh, Carmilla, I, I mentioned to you in passing the Castlevania series that was just on Netflix that has kind of a bi maybe bisexual vampire character. Um, the Gilda Stories by Jewel Gomez. 
uh, which features again, I think that that character is a, a bisexual vampire, or at least is a sapphic vampire. Um, Linda in the chat uh, asks, is the metaphor the vampire, quote, making the victims gay? I think in a lot of these stories, the answer is yes. Um, especially when you go back to Oscar Wilde, one of the judges literally refers to it as Oscar Wilde spreading a ring of corruption. Um, he refers to homosexuality as a ring of corruption. And the vampire is spreading vampirism in metaphorically a very similar way. Again, whether it's not good representation, like in all honesty, it is not a nice metaphor. Um, but it definitely, I think, in stories like The Vampire and Dracula and a lot of other novels, it, it definitely represents the vampire turning their victims gay. Yeah, we have some, some activity in the chat. Theo answers the question. Uh, at the end of the slideshow saying it can be tiring to be lumped in with the villain characters in media, but vampires are sexy though. Um, Sarah mentions Queen of the Dam. What was damned was the fun millennial sapphic vampire story of my college years. Definitely just text, not subtext. Um, and then Julia asks, how do children complicate this? Claudia, an in interview with the vampire or um, the vampire child from the, the horror movie, Let the Right One In. Yeah, that definitely does complicate it. And again, I think the vampire can serve as a metaphor for a lot of things. Um, I, like, absolutely, the vampire can be queer coded, but it can really be represent the other in a lot of different ways um Bram Stoker was not just anxious about Oscar Wilde he was anxious about colonialism and will England be colonized the way we have colonized others he was anxious about the role of women he was anxious about the 20th century and what's going to happen in this new era and so when it comes to characters like Claudia it, it definitely becomes a lot more complicated. And I don't know if the metaphor fits her perfectly. It definitely fits the relationship between Louis and Lestat. Uh, I don't know if it fits Claudia other than them becoming a family unit. When it comes to let the right one in though, in a lot of ways that is a love story. It doesn't have to be sexual. It can still be love. And the love between the child vampire and the child it's a very sweet one and they really understand each other and i think just because the stories are inherently about children in that particular instance finding your best friends and both of them being outsiders and finding each other i think is one of a major theme in that story yeah there's um Another question or, or sort of a comment that um, Bridge is wondering if the, the involvement of children, if there's that's a fear around queerness and pedophilia, um, that could be a theme. Um, but we, we have a question about other legends and stories and I think paranormal figures. You know, do you see similar parallels in, I know we're talking about Dracula, but do you see similar parallels in werewolf stories and legends or, or other sort of supernatural figures and um, Han asked that question. Um, I'm trying to think of what other sort of creatures are out there. Um, the big one would definitely probably be werewolves. I'm, my thing is definitely vampires. Um, so I'm not as familiar with all of the, like the werewolf legends, um, but there's definitely, one of the biggest things about werewolf legends is one of the cures, or at least one of the ways to change a werewolf back in some legends is your true love accepting you um, and going out to meet you with bravery and putting a cloak on you in some legends and in other legends just defying the fear of the monster. So there could definitely be a queer reading to that, but at the same time, werewolf legends 
also are as multifaceted as vampire legends. Yeah, I, I don't know. That just makes me think of Twilight, which I think is probably an unqueer novel is the way to describe that be, in the way that it was uh, written and inv involved very heteronormative romances. Um, but that's neither here nor there, I suppose. Uh, Jennifer comments, it seems like the men are intrinsically drawn to Dracula, even with the quote, Lucy beard, um, but that the brides saw Dracula as unattainable regardless of their bride status. Um, and they're wondering, is this just more Dracula makes you gay or how men are subconsciously drawn to men and therefore women can tell? Um, do you have any thoughts on that? It's, it's a good question. Um, I think Part of it is, it seems one of the things about that relationship is each of those women in Dracula's castle seems to have had a long-standing relationship with him for a while. And it almost makes me wonder if once he got tired with them, he moved on to the next person and maybe Jonathan was just the next person after that. Um, so it's, it's hard to say. Um, but especially because Mina in the story plays such a major role and it's such a significant character that I just did not get the chance to talk about in the lecture. It's, it's hard to say for sure if this is queer coding or just subconscious. I'm not sure about that. Yeah. Um, I don't know if this, this question is related. I do want to comment. Uh, Hexel was like, unqueer Twilight. Meyer tried so hard to make Bella as straight or make it straight. She circled right back around to a queer coded Bella. And I think Kristen Stewart helped with that. We could do an entire uh, event on um, Twilight, everyone. Although in the end, she Bella still ends up in a really straight family unit and her werewolf best friend is in love with her baby. And it's, <laughs> it gets... I think it gets creepy. Um, there was a, a couple of questions about, um, let's see, uh, one question from John about including Vlad Tepish or, or not including Vlad Tepish in this um, presentation. And did you do you have any thoughts yeah. on that? John asked, why did you leave, leave out Vlad Tepish? Um, more than anything. Um, I was really impressed I kept it to 45 minutes, to be honest. Um, I meant to include him a bit more with sort of vampire legends and lore at the very beginning, um, because he was a real figure. And there was a specific book, and I'll, I'll need to double check the name of it, that Bram Stoker read that was all about Eastern Europe, their myths, their legends, and what life is like in the Carpathian Mountains that was published in the 1880s or 1890s um and a lot of what he writes about Transylvania comes from that book um so Vlad Tepish definitely is an inspiration um and a very significant one I didn't include him as sort of some of the queer inspirations because I really cannot say for sure I do not think that was relevant to that, but it's definitely relevant to the overall inspirations and something I definitely should have put at the very beginning. So we have another question about sort of some more of those um, uh, cultural anxieties that inform the Dracula story. So Stead asks, you know, is the, the early feminist movement, um, which included early, included queer leaders, including Susan Anthony, um, do you see anything specific about the rise of queer women activists as one on the cultural anxieties informing Dracula? Um, I definitely think in Dracula, it very much applies to the characterizations of Lucy and Mina and sort of the characters they represent. They even joke in the novel about the new woman, um, which was really the term at the time for these young women who are going out and working and living independent lives and aren't necessarily married yet and have their own money and their own agency, which 
in the grand scheme of the Victorian era was definitely a newer sort of daily concepts. And this is also an era of quote unquote Boston marriages. Um, and there's definitely that angle with Lucy and Mina as well. The two of them are not of the same social class. They are very different socially, but the two of them are best friends and they have declarations of love for each other in a way that was very common at the time. And so I think, again, the fear of these romantic friendships coupled with sort of the rise of female independence definitely played a role. And you also see that in the 60s and 70s in vampire movies. The Carmilla Hammer movies that came out in the 70s are 100% a direct response to the feminist movement. Um, these things always go hand in hand. Um, so we have a couple more questions. Uh, and one of them, um, before we get to the recommendation questions, um, Baz is asking, could you consider Dracula the character to be kind of uh, representation of bisexual between the brides, Harker and Nina? Um, even though the language wasn't there, I sort of, uh, yeah. So Baz is saying you always hear, never hear about bi representation in history because it's always brushed off as a beard of some sort. Um, I personally think it's more of like, there's something queer going on since the language isn't there. It's not the same language we use now, um, that you could definitely look at all of the, uh, extramarital interest that's going on in Dracula is just like one big queer melting pot. And I love the word queer because I'm a millennial. Um, so, which includes some bisexual or what we now might call pansexual interest. Um, do you have any comments on that, Megan? I think you really hit the nail on the head there. Um, it really seems like Dracula clearly has interest in Lucy. He clearly has interest in Mina, but he also very much has interest in Jonathan as well. And I think all of those definitely exist in valid interpretations. And that's the reason I was using queer, like obviously when referring to like Oscar Wilde and all of that, homosexuality as a concept really becomes well known. But as far as, you know, bisexuality, it's something I absolutely agree with. I think because the language didn't exist, we try to pigeonhole people in some places. And that's why I think queer is a very useful word um, because I think it really encapsulates all sorts of things when we can't know for sure. Um, but I can, I can definitely personally see a very bisexual reading of Dracula 100%. Awesome. Baz, thank you for the question. And then it's eight o'clock right now, but we have two questions left that I think will be fun to leave us on. Um, one is from, from Chris and Chris is asking, is there a biography of Stoker that you might recommend? Um, so there was one that was just written. Um, I forget the name of it off the top of my head. After this, I can definitely email you, Joan, and we can have like a, a bibliography. <laughs> Um, of things I would recommend reading on this topic and just in general. But there was one that was recently written that focuses a bit more on Bram Stoker's queerness. Um, as for a general biography, I was kind of going just biographically through the archives and then through a lot of academic articles, um, which have been very helpful for researching the subject. Um, so I'll, I'll definitely have to think and get back to you on that one. Great. And um, I will say Malcolm recommends Bram Stoker and the Man Who Was Dracula, which I'll have to, that's by Barbara Belford, and I'll have to add that to my uh, to read list. And then the final question for tonight uh, is, what's your favorite version of the Dracula story in film or fiction or whatever? I love that question. Um, my favorite of all time is the original 1950s Hammer Dracula, um, the one that stars Peter Cushing as Van Helsing and Christopher Lee as Dracula. It is nothing like the novel. It is 
completely different in almost every single way, but it is such a fun adaptation. Um, and I definitely recommend that one and its sequels for sure. Awesome. Baz is saying we should check out the uh, web series version of Carmilla where they are a queer vampire, lesbian journalist, and a non or there's a queer vampire, a lesbian journalist, and a non binary mad scientist, which sounds like so much fun. I know people my age, we all saw the 90 or what was it? Was it Dracula 2000? Is that the one I'm thinking of? <laughs> that was, uh, uh, I'm sure we could have another conversation about people coming out in the 90s after they saw Dracula. Um, but anyway, that's neither here nor there. Um, it's past eight. We try not to keep folks too late as it is still a school night. Um, so I just want to say again, thank you so much, Megan, for being here with us tonight. Um, everyone in the chat is sending you a lot of really nice messages. So I'll make sure that you get that chat transcript later. Thank you all so much for being here with us tonight. Um, I will send an email with some links to sources from Megan, as well as um, information about upcoming events and uh, things going on in the History Project and elsewhere. Um, for the next three days, happy LGBTQ History Month, everyone. Um, and I hope to see you all again soon. Have a wonderful evening. Oh, I didn't end the recording. <laughs>